Welcome to the next level with Pastor John Chamnus, where we take you to the next level through revelation from the Word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Get ready to go to the next level now. With your word for today, here's Pastor John. What Patricia shared in the offering message, we kind of talked about it briefly last night. And uh, after her conversation on the phone, and I already had this message prepared for the most part. I knew where I was going. Um, and really what she shared in the offering message was, I mean, it, it just fits hand in glove with what I'm going to share this morning. But in the, in the book of Daniel, chapter 11, verse 32, uh, I'm using the King James Version. She'll be putting up probably New American Standard. That's okay. But King James Version says this, says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Um, I have very few notes this morning, actually. So I really intended to just speak a lot from my heart this morning. And um, I have been one who I have a, a very deep passion for uh, seeing people healed. I have a very deep passion for seeing people set free from, from addiction, drugs, and alcohol, and, and uh, seeing people filled with the Holy Spirit, and seeing just those things that we could probably all just put a label on it and say these are things that are more like you know supernatural type uh, things that happen. I've, I've always had a very deep, strong passion for those things. But here lately I've been, uh, as you well know, I've been seeking God and I've been talking to God every day and among the prayers that I pray every day uh, I, I pray for myself as well and the prayers that I pray for myself recently they go like this God <laughs> you know I apologize if I get emotional uh, I don't know it's just something that God is just I mean he's just doing this but among the prayers that I pray for myself it goes like this part of them go like this God Please change me. <laughs> and I feel with every fiber of my being that God is changing me. And, uh, you know, I've encouraged you in the past, in the past few weeks, that, you know, this is something that I, I would encourage you to pray, get in front of God and get in His presence and. And tell God, you know, because sometimes this is something that we don't ask God for. We don't ask God to change us. You know, we ask God to do this for us. We ask God to do that for us. We ask God to give us this or, or to make, make this possible for us to have this or whatever. But we don't often get in the presence of God and ask God to change us. And I'm still asking God for stuff. I'm still believing God for things. Things that not, don't just benefit me, but things that benefit this church and this ministry. I'm still asking God for those things. But at the same time, it's like God has removed a veil from my eyes and caused me to be able to see that, you know what? If you're going to receive some of these larger things that you're asking for, that you're believing me for, then it's going to require you to change. And so... Um, are we having issues with Sam? Okay. The sound is correct. Okay. <clears throat> but God is saying that if you're going to receive those things that you're asking me for, those big things, those things that are far and away above and beyond what you can ask, think, or imagine, then it's going to require you to change. And the way I understand it is this, is if you can receive those things right now the way that you are, then you already have them. Amen. But if if you find it that you're, uh, you know, it's it's not coming. The manifestation is not coming quickly. It's not coming easily. Then it's it's not. You know, God's never the problem. Amen. We know that God's never the problem. But the problem may be that we need to change. We need to change. And I'm not saying that you're uh, that that we're in sin. I'm not saying that uh, we don't love God. I'm not saying that uh, you know there's any kind of an issue like that. But there are 
always a deeper dimension. There is always a higher height. There's always a depth that we've not penetrated to in the presence of God. There's always something more that God can touch in our heart and in our life in order to bring a transformation that changes us to the degree that makes it easy for us to receive what God has for us. Does that make sense? Amen. If that makes sense, say amen. Just so I know you're with me. Praise the Lord. Amen. So in the book of Luke chapter 14, the first five verses there. Uh, actually, the title of this message I put on it this morning is pulling the donkey out of the ditch. And I know this passage of scripture doesn't call it a donkey. It calls it an ox. Which So uh, either way, it doesn't really make that much difference. But in uh, Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse one, it says it happened that when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, talking about Jesus, they were watching him closely. And there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. That's just a disease. I don't even know what kind of disease it is, but it's something that's undesirable. It was, it was some kind of a disease or disorder that, um, you know, it's not fun to have. Amen. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Now, I think Jesus is getting a little bit smart. I don't mean smart mouth, <laughs> but I mean, there's times when Jesus healed people on the Sabbath and then he was immediately attacked by the Pharisees after performing a healing on the Sabbath. Amen. And so in this particular case, Jesus addresses the Pharisees before he does the healing. And he, he, he tells the scribes and Pharisees, he says, hey, is it lawful? To heal on the Sabbath. And of course nobody answered. Uh, they kept silent it says. And he took hold of him. And healed him. Talking about the man with the dropsy. And he sent them away. And he said to them. Talking about the Pharisees again. Which one of you. Will have a son. Or an ox. Fall into a well. And will not immediately pull him out. On a Sabbath day. And so, oops, basically what I'm getting out of this verse here, and I want us to see, is there is a tendency for one group of people here to be legalistic, to be rigid, to be um, unmerciful, to be unforgiving, to be critical, and that is not the way of Jesus. Amen. And so what I see here more than anything else is that Jesus heals this man, but he heals him from a motivation of love because he said, who of you would have a son that falls into a pit or into a well or an ox? This is a son or an ox. I mean, <laughs> the son would certainly be more valuable than an ox, but even if it was an ox, you know, falls into a well uh, it, on the Sabbath, you're going to pull him out of there. You're not going to say, well, I'm sorry, son. You're going to have to stay in there until tomorrow. <laughs> You're going to pull them out. Amen. And the motivation is because I love my son. I love him. I'm not going to allow him to stay in the well or down in the pit any longer than is absolutely necessary. I don't care if it's a Sunday. I don't care if it's a Sabbath day. I don't care what day of the week it is. I'm going to do whatever is necessary to pull him out. And so I see an immense love in the heart of Jesus for humanity in this verse. And I've been studying and, and we've been going through the book of John on Tuesday nights and we've been getting into some things here that um, I, I believe really God is doing a shift, shifting my focus um, from some of the things that are just, you know, supernaturally labeled as, well, that's a supernatural thing, healings and miracles and, and those types of things. And uh, as I'm praying God change me, he's, he's pulling my attention from those things over into what I will just call the supernatural power of love. The supernatural power of loving people. And in John chapter 13, which is where we were this past week, Jesus, in the, in the first part of John chapter 13, he takes a towel and he girds himself and he's in the room with the disciples and he begins to, uh, to get down on his knees with a basin of water and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. 
This is the master of all the universe and he's getting on his knees with a towel and he's washing the feet of Peter and James and John and the other disciples. And he looks at them and he says this word. He says this phrase to them. He says, you guys should do this for each other. And I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what he said. You guys should do this for each other. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the rabbi, I'm the teacher, I'm the master, but I'm on my knees and I'm, I'm down here at your feet and I'm washing the, the part of the world that tried to cling to you as you walk through your day. As you come into the house, I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to get a towel and I'm going to get a basin of water and I'm going to wash that world off of your feet. I'm not going to stand off at a distance and point at you and say, you got world clinging to you. I can't have anything to do with you. Uh, no, I'm going to get the water of the word and I'm going to do whatever it takes to cleanse and to wash that stuff off of you because I know that's not part of who you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is a supernatural act of love. And so what Patricia said in the offering message, you know what I mean? I did. I, I, I admit that I unfriended somebody on Facebook. And I know that is an atrocity. <laughs> because it's never true until it's posted on Facebook. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But no, I mean, in all seriousness, I know how much that can hurt. And I told Patricia when I did that uh, under under a misinterpretation. When I did that and I unfriended him and obviously I didn't unfriend anybody else in the household. But I unfriended the mother. And when I did it, I told Patricia and this was what a month ago or two months, two months ago. I said, Honey, that was one of the hardest things <laughs> I've ever had to do because we've been through that. We've been shunned. We have been treated like, you know, we weren't even Christian anymore. We, we were treated like we had committed an unpardonable sin. And still are to this day. And it's been five, six years. Not huh? seven <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Amen. And it's hard not to get bitter. It's hard not to get hardened against those people who have treated you that way. But when I read the scripture where Jesus says to his disciples, you're going to do this. You're going to do this. The same thing I'm doing for you. You're going to do this for each other. Then I realize, you know what? It's just out of Ignorance, and I'm not saying they're ignorant. I'm, I'm not calling, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that they don't know the depth of the love of God. To hold something against somebody because they didn't act the way you thought they should act, and to shun like that. And so, anyway. I sent a new friend request last night. Amen. And it was accepted. And, um, you know, we love, we love her. We love her family. Uh, it was, it was very hard for me to see them go. And um, if, if they walked back in the building right now, I would receive them with every bit of love in my heart. There would not be any awkwardness whatsoever. Not on our part, we would do everything within our ability to make sure that there was no awkwardness in them as well. Amen. Because we love them and God loves them. And we're all part of the same family. Amen. But in John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus goes on to say this. He says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. This could be a short message today, I think. Short. Like Miss Debbie. <laughs> she didn't hear me say that. Let me tell you something funny. <laughs> I was sitting on the front row by her the other night, well, about a week and a half ago, and uh, Pastor Jim was ministering, and at the end of his message, he says, everybody stand up. You know how we do. 
and uh, where she stood up, I stood up, and I, I walked over to where she was, and I leaned over and I said, Miss Debbie, he said stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, amen. <laughs> but Jesus says here in John 13, verse 35, he says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And this is really ministering to me. And I'm not saying that God is, is uh, shifting the focus away from healings and deliverance and, and setting people free from drug addiction and alcohol and tobacco addictions and things of that nature. He's not shifting the focus away from those things uh, to not do them any longer. He's shifting the focus uh, onto love because love is the channel by which those things are unlocked. Jesus here, he says, this is how you will know. This is how they will know that you are my disciples. Not because you heal the sick, not because you cleanse the lepers or you raise the dead or you can cast out devils. Those things are awesome. They're great things. But that's not what he said. He said, they will know that you are my disciples because of your love for one another. And if we don't have love for one another, if we don't love each other, if we don't show love for one another, then nobody out there can tell that we are disciples of Jesus. This is the one thing, the one test that he gave to his disciples for people in the world to know who you are and who you serve is not that you walk in power, but it's that you walk in the love of almighty God for humanity. And walking in love is not weakness. Walking in love is, is not, uh, you don't need to be afraid that if you walk in love that you're going to get run over and you're going to get abused and you're going to get mistreated and you're going to get taken advantage of. Walking in love, when you really understand walking in love, then you will begin to walk exactly like Jesus did because that is how Jesus lived. And you'll begin to see the power of God manifest in your life and in your ministry and in, in your family and in the people that you minister to and the people that you pray for, you'll start to see prayers get answered more often and more powerfully than they ever have before because you're shifting your focus not from what you can receive, but you're shifting your focus into what God really cares about, that you share the love that He has shed abroad in our hearts. And you share that with other people. And God says, that's something that I can get involved with. Amen. All of these things, all of these are things by which we can show the love of God by praying for the sick, by casting out devils, by healing, healing, people, healing the sick, blessing people financially. How about that? Hallelujah. I thought about it as I prepared for this message that, you know, I wasn't always Pastor John. I wasn't always even a disciple of Jesus. I wasn't always somebody who went to church. How about you all? I know Elisa, she's gone to church from the time she came out of the womb. <laughs> even before that. <laughs> Amen. But it's probably not the case for most of us. And so I thought about myself, you know, instead of preaching about you, I'll just preach about myself. OK, because I know from Pastor Jim, that seems like that's what works better. <laughs> Can't talk about you. I'll talk about me. But as I remembered how I used to be. I used to be before I started serving God. And of course, you know, it's been a process. But before I started serving God, Definitely, I was selfish. I was self-serving, self-seeking. I didn't care much about anybody else. I was out to get whatever I could get. Amen. I was selfish. How else was I? I was inconsiderate of other people. You know, I didn't care about leaving the grocery cart in the middle of the parking lot or in a parking spot that, you know, somebody couldn't park in now because that's where my car is sitting. And that's just a small thing. But you know what I'm saying? I didn't care to cut somebody off in traffic. I didn't care about those things. I was inconsiderate. How else was I? I was stingy. I worked hard for what I got. And so was I going to give something to somebody? Not likely. 
Not likely. I wanted to keep everything that I got for myself because I was selfish, but I was also stingy. How else was I? I was critical of others. I would point the finger and, and, and tell somebody and talk about them behind their back even. I would tell somebody what was wrong with them and how wrong they were and how ugly they were and how, how, whatever, how much I don't like them. I was critical and judgmental is very closely related to that. I was so judgmental of others. Anybody relate to that before you came to Christ? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Amen. But you know, along with that, how was I before Jesus, BC? How was I before Christ? I was lonely. You know, I had girlfriends. I had a girlfriend, one at a time, usually. Sometimes none at all. But even when I had a girlfriend, in here, I was still lonely because no matter how pretty that girl was or no matter how often we spent time together, she could not fulfill what was in my heart that was lacking, that was empty, that, that space in there that only God could fill. And so it didn't matter how many people I surrounded myself, how many friends I had or, or how much time I spent at the bar with my friends and my buddies and, and all of that kind of stuff. I was still lonely on the inside. And every time I would come home, I would remember laying down in my bed and looking up at the ceiling, being afraid. Yes, I was afraid. B.C., before Christ, I was afraid. And I would go home and I would look up at the ceiling before I went to sleep and I would say this prayer out of my head. God, I, I, please forgive me. Because I didn't know that Jesus might come back that night. And I knew I was living in sin. And I was lonely, but I was scared too. Because I knew that I was not living, serving God. And I knew that's what God intended for me to do was to live a life that pleased him and serve him. And I would lay down in my bed and I would cry out to God and I would say just from my head, not from my heart. I would say, God, please forgive me because I didn't want to go to hell if something happened to me in the middle of the night or if Jesus came back while I was asleep. But I had no intention whatsoever. This is why I say out of my head. I had no intention whatsoever of changing how I was living. I was just saying that prayer out of fear just so I could go to sleep that night. How else was I? I was angry. I was angry that I had been hurt by people. I had been hurt by women. I had been hurt by other people. I was angry on the inside. I was bitter. I was hurt too, yes. I was wounded. But I want to tell you that in the middle of all of those things that I used to be before Christ, somebody, really I can, I can look back and I can, I can remember about two people, two or three people who cared enough about me who cared enough about what God's word says. They cared enough to reach out to me and to say, hey, I just want to invite you to church. <laughs> and I think about what would have happened to me? What would my life be like if there was no one that cared enough to approach me and to say, hey, you know what? God loves you. God loves you. And I just want you to know that, that we care about you and we want to invite you to, to we, we want to invite you to church. And they didn't leave it at one time. Every time I would see this person, they would invite me to church. They'd invite me to church, probably invited me to church about six times before I decided, hey, okay, I'm, I'm going to give it a try. And she said, this one woman in particular, she said to me, just let me know when you're going to be coming and I'll talk to my son and his, his wife and I'll have them meet you at the door and they'll sit with you so that you don't have to sit by yourself. And I said, oh, no, 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 that's okay. That's okay. I don't mind sitting by myself. I'm just going to try it and see if I like it. 
So I don't mind coming by myself, coming on my own. I'll just sneak in. I'll just have, I'll just find my own seat somewhere. That's okay, but thank you. But I still went. She wasn't going to leave me alone. Because she cared enough about God. She cared enough about the word. And she knew what Jesus said in John chapter 13. When he said, this is how they will know that you are my disciples. Because you have love for one another. And she loved me enough to not back off. She loved me enough to not quit inviting me and asking me to come to church. And so finally I showed up. And when I showed up, you know, for the most part, it was a, it was a religious church. It wasn't a spirit-filled church at all. They don't know a fraction of what we know But you know what? There were people there that loved God. There were people there that served God. There was people there that loved people because that's what the Bible says to do. The Bible says love people. <laughs> when I showed up at that place, even though it wasn't spirit filled, even though there wasn't uh, people lifting their hands in worship service, and that's that's how I was raised. So I was like, I'm looking around, I'm like, man, nobody's lifting their hands. This, this, the music was good. The preaching was, it was okay. But there was something there in that atmosphere. And it was the love that I felt, the love of God that I felt from the people that were there in that place. And it gripped my heart. My heart that was broken, my heart that was hurting, my heart that was lonely, my heart that had been abused, my heart that was growing cold and hardened. All of a sudden in the atmosphere of God's house, that somebody who loved God enough and loved people enough to not back off of inviting me over and over and over and over and over again until I showed up and got into that atmosphere. In that atmosphere. I could not deny the love of God. William Booth, many of you will recognize his name. He was the founder of the Salvation Army. And when he was conducting his ministry, he had a powerful, powerful ministry. Evangelistic ministry. I mean, souls came into the kingdom I mean, like crazy. It was amazing. The ministry of William Booth. You should check it out and find out what God did through that man. But William Booth, he would have people come up to him and say, hey, we want to uh, we want to do something to cause our church to grow. We want new people to come in. We want we want people. And this is <laughs> this is right here where the rubber meets the road for us. We want to do something that will cause people to come in and accept Jesus. What would you say to us? What would you tell us to do? And the way the story goes, it goes like this. William Booth's response to these young men of God was this. Two words. He wrote it down on a brown paper sack. Two words he wrote down and gave to them. And those two words were this. Try tears. <laughs> when I first heard that, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, you can't you can't generally make yourself cry for something. I guess some people can. I mean, I can. Most of the time when I start to cry, I, I do my best to stop myself. <laughs> but his response was try tears. But the meaning, the force behind those two words was this. Get in the presence of God. Get in his word and study. Get in the presence of God until he so changes your heart that you're not concerned about just building your church. You're concerned about the compassion and the passion that God has for people out there who are lost. That you weep over them like what Jesus did in John chapter 11, verse 35, when it says Jesus wept over Lazarus. 
There's a, a passage in the scripture that talks about when Jesus looked over the city of Jerusalem and he knew that they had not accepted him as the Messiah, as the savior that he was. And the Bible says that he wept over Jerusalem. And so the words of William Booth carry all of the force of the heart of God and the love of God for people out there who are lost, people out there who are hurting, just like I used to be before Christ. But somebody cared enough, somebody loved enough to open their mouth, to take a risk, the risk of rejection, the risk of being cussed out, the risk of being having, having somebody turn their back on you, the risk of somebody uh, spouting off their mouth at you, the risk of somebody talking about you behind your back, the risk of failure. Somebody took that risk and they said, I love God enough and I love people enough to know that God wants to connect with every single human being out there. And so, you know what? I am not going to. I'm not going to stay quiet. I'm not going to stay silent. I am going to go and share the love of God with every person that I can. That none should be lost. I know this is a different kind of a message. I'm a different kind of a pastor today. I hope it's okay. I hope you're hearing what God is saying. Let's not I'll make any apologies for it. I can only tell you what God has placed on my heart to tell you. But listen, we've got to, we got we got to get this. We've got to get the fact that there are people out there lost. There are people out there hurting. There are people out there dying. There are people out there who are crying out on the inside. They're lonely, and they more than anything. They need Jesus. I'm going to the book of Isaiah chapter 62. I want you to see this. I call this message pulling the donkey out of the ditch. Listen, there's, there's people out there. The same passion that we would have if our son fell in a well or if our ox fell in a ditch or fell in the, in the well, fell in a pit. We would do whatever it takes to pull them out. <laughs> Listen, I'm asking you to feel the heart of God this morning. I'm asking you to, to sense and to know the passion of God for people. And for you to take on the responsibility of being God's mouth, of being God's hands and being God's feet in this planet. Because if you don't, Maybe nobody else will. And God so much wants to pull his son out of the pit. He wants so much to pull the donkey out of the pit. You might say, well, it's a donkey. They're a donkey. You know, another bird for donkey. <laughs> they don't act right. They don't talk right. They don't live right. I would say that fully qualifies them to be pulled out of the pit. Wouldn't you? We're not looking for perfect people to rescue. We are looking for people that God perfectly loves to rescue. I was filling up my car with gas the other day. And I happened to have $3 in my pocket. And this man walked by. I wasn't getting three dollars worth of gas, but <laughs> you understand. But this this man walked by through the parking lot, and I glanced at him. I could tell he was of the homeless variety, and he was walking by. And I knew that if I made eye contact with him, he was going to start talking to me, and he was going to ask me for help. I just knew that. But I looked at him, I guess, enough for him to trigger that, and so. He did. He walked up to me and he started talking to me. And the first thing he said was, hey, and, and I could barely understand what he was saying. He said, hey, would you be able to do anything for me to help me with some breakfast? <laughs> and I said, man, I got three dollars in my pocket. And I reached in my pocket and I grabbed my three dollars. 
And I reached it out to him and handed it to him. And I said, but you know what? You need Jesus in your heart. So, oh yeah, yeah, I know. I got, I got Jesus in my heart. I got Jesus in my heart. I said, yeah, but you've got to serve him. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you. God has his finger right here. He's changing Pastor John. He is answering my prayer because in the past, you know what I would have done? I, I would have taken a three dollars where I would have said, man, you know what? I'm, I'm sorry. I just I can't help you. Or I would have at least I would have taken the three dollars. I would have handed it to him and I would have said, God bless you. But I found without my mind even being engaged in what was happening here, I, I handed him three dollars. I said, you need Jesus in your heart. Oh, I got Jesus in my heart. I got, and I can't even hardly understand what he's saying, but I'm, I, I can catch the basics of what he's trying to get out. And he's like, I, I got Jesus in my heart. I said, yeah, but you need to serve him. Oh, yeah, I know. We got to serve Jesus. We got to serve Jesus. <laughs> but I can tell, you know, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't need to go much further than that. But the guy needed to hear about Jesus and that it's not just about having him in your heart you need to serve him because when you serve him God's going to take care of you and that's what I told him I said I said no 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 you're not you're not hearing what I'm saying when you serve Jesus he will take care of you and then he just walked on walked on his way but what I found is that where I would have responded differently in the past, now I found the, the words of God coming out of my mouth because I've been uh, in God's presence and he's been ministering to me on the love of God. And every Tuesday night, we end the message with this question, what are you going to do this week to advance the kingdom of God? And Tuesday, we were talking about the love of God. And I, I said, so, you know, this makes it easy. Just find somebody, find one person this week that you are determined that you are going to share the love of God with. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to ask you to do something that I'm not going to do. And when you get determined, listen, God's going to send you. He's going to put people in front of you. That you can share the love of Jesus with. It might cost you a little bit of money. It might cost you your comfort zone. It might cost you some words. Isaiah 62. Listen to this. Verse 1 says, For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not keep quiet until her righteousness goes forth like brightness and her salvation like a torch that is burning. Listen, one of the things that, that I recognize here about this region of Kentucky is that the strongholds that have existed in this region, whether they're religion or addiction, Poverty, whatever they may be, the strongholds that exist in this region are not going to fall without concerted, um, without determined, dedicated prayer. And, you know, praying, praying 10 or 15 minutes over the region is not, is not going to be enough. So this is another thing that God is, is sharing. He's just dealing with me about this. Listen, if you're if you're serious about changing a region, well, I know it's all by faith. You know, the strongholds come down by faith. You just you just agree. We've decreed it. We've decreed it already. We speak. It, we you know we've done everything that we know to do. But I'm telling you, this is the word of the Lord. He's saying, listen, you need to you need to step up your prayer. You need to increase your prayer. You need to pray more intensely. You need to pray more more uh, more time in prayer uh, to set this region free and to make a difference in this part of Kentucky. And I'm answering that call and I'm saying, God, you know, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. And because I feel your love for this people, 
Because I feel your heart for these people, I don't mind to sacrifice some of my sleep time to get up and to spend time as a watchman on the wall and looking over this region and praying and decreeing what you show me in the middle of the night or in the wee hours of the morning because I want to see a region transformed by the power of God. I'm willing to do that. Verse 7, look at this. This is a verse that touches God's heart. It says, and give him no rest. It's talking about God there. Give him no rest. Give him no rest. You know, there's a, a verse in the Bible that says, that God speaks there and he says, uh, Concerning the works of my hands, command ye me. That's in the King James. Concerning the works of my hands, command me. Or remind me of what my promises say. But here in this verse, he says, listen, I'm inviting you. Don't give me any rest until. What does it say? Until he establishes and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And when I read that the other day, I feel like God directed me to this passage and says, listen, I want to, my desire is to, my heart, my love is to change this region and to transform it with, with my spirit, with an outpouring, with revival, with, with signs and wonders, with people being saved, with people being healed and set free, with, with people coming off of drugs, with, with people uh, coming out of poverty, with people um, increasing financially, with families being saved, with, with people's lives being transformed and changed. That's my heart. That's my love. That's my passion for this region. Give me no rest until I make this region a praise in Kentucky. Give me no rest. I said, all right, God. All right, God, I'm going to turn it up. I'm going to increase it. Because I feel your heart. And I don't know, and I really don't even care how many people God has called on in the past to do the same thing and that they were not willing to go the distance and they weren't willing to sacrifice for it and they weren't willing to do what was necessary. But I don't want to be that person. I don't want somebody else that God have to call on somebody else and say, because you wouldn't do it. I'm going to have to call on somebody else to stand in the gap and make up the hedge on their behalf. God, I'm going to say, God, I'm your man. Haven't we taught this? Haven't we preached it? I want you. I want you to join with me. I want you to say, you know what? I'm willing to stand in the gap. I'm willing to, to tap in into the presence of God and to feel God's heart and to take God's heart to this region. I'm willing to do it. Knowing the only way they're going to know that we are his disciples is because we love the way God loves. I want that so much. I want people to look at me. I want people to look at you and say, you're a believer aren't you? You're one of those Christians, aren't you? Yes, I am. How do you know? I just feel, I just feel love. I just feel something that I'm not used to. I just feel the love of God when I'm around you. I want that so bad for us. Do you want that for yourself? Verse 10. In Isaiah 62, listen, says this. Go through, go through the gates, clear the way for the people, build up, build up a highway, remove the stones, lift up a standard over the people. Behold, the Lord has proclaimed to the end of the earth, say to the daughter of Zion, lo, your salvation comes. 
Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And you will be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. And I say this is the word of the Lord for this region. So listen, what we don't do anymore, what we used to do, is to shun people and to treat them like they don't exist anymore because they don't go to our church anymore. Obviously, we don't do that. What we do, what we do to replace that is we share the love of God. We share his heart. We share his words of love with everybody, including those. Listen, we were literally taught to cross the street if we saw somebody that used to go to our church that doesn't go anymore. To cross the street to avoid them. No, not, not here, but in the church where we used to go. Yeah. We were literally taught that. We were literally taught that if somebody who used to go to our church that doesn't go anymore, that you know, if they came up to hug us, we were, we were to just remain rigid. That was taught from the pool. And like Patricia said, we never, it never felt right. It never sat right with us. We never agreed with that. And you know what? I never did it. We would see people out there and I couldn't help but just, you know, go up to them and say, hey, how you doing? We love you. We hope you're doing good. You know, we don't need to be so foolish as to think that Grace Fellowship is the only church that God uh, has a plan and a purpose for. If somebody feels like they're called to some other ministry, some other church somewhere, and they can be fed the word of God and draw closer to God in some other place, then we want that for you. We want that for them. But know this, that we're going to do our best right here to touch the heart of God and to get the word of God to share with you and to do whatever it takes to make sure that you stay washed from the world and that you uh, are able to receive blessing from God as much as you are able to receive. We're going to stand in the gap for those out there that are lost. And we're going to be, uh, we're going to be a beacon here in this place, a beacon of hope for people to come in and to receive Christ and to Know God for who he is and to be touched and set free. And that's what we are going to be about right here in this place. Amen. So I welcome anyone, anyone who feels like I've got to be a part of something like that. I've got to be a part of a place that has vision to touch and to reach out and to transform a region like that. I've got to be a part of that. I invite anyone who feels the call to be a part of that, you come on because we are ready to receive you. Amen. We are ready to love you. We are ready to teach you how to love others in a way that God can take it and use it to change lives. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. We're in Jesus. Almighty name. Thank you, God. Let's stand together this morning. Father. Thank you for joining us today on The Next Level. We invite you to visit us for one of our live services, Sundays at 10 a.m. at Grace Fellowship. We're located at 1925 Highway 11 South in Baydeville. You can also visit us on the web at www.graceofbaydeville.org. We look forward to seeing you again soon, at the next level.